History of Ethiopia, published December the 9th, 2017. Special characters are denoted as follows. And left and right parentheses. An M dash. This article covers the prehistory and history of Ethiopia, from emergence as an empire under the Axiomites to its current form as the Federal Democratic Republic of Ethiopia, as well as the history of other rare areas in what is now Ethiopia such as the Afar Triangle. The Ethiopian Empire. Abyssinia was first founded by Habesha people in the Ethiopian highlands. Due to migration and imperial expansion, it grew to include many other primarily Afro-Asiatic speaking communities, including Oromos, Amhara, Somalis, Tigray, Afars, Sidama, Guraj, Agor and Harari, among others. One of the earliest kingdoms to rise to power in the territory was the Kingdom of DMT in the 10th century BCE which established its capital at Yeha. In the 1st century CE the Aksumite kingdom rose to power in the Tigray region with its capital at Aksum and grew into a major power on the Red Sea, subjugating Yemen and Mero and converting to Christianity in the early 4th century. The Aksumite empire fell into decline with the rise of Islam, forcing the Ethiopians to move south into the highlands for refuge. The Aksumites gave way to the Zagu dynasty who established a new capital at Lalibela, before giving way to the Solomonic dynasty in the 13th century. During the early Solomonic period Ethiopia went through military reforms and imperial expansion that made it dominate the Horn of Africa. Portuguese missionaries arrived at this time. In 1529, a conquest of Abyssinia. Futa al-Habash by the Ottoman allied Somali Muslim Adal Sultanate devastated the highlands, and was only deterred by a Portuguese intervention. With both Ethiopia and Adal greatly weakened by the war, the Oromo people were able to invade into the highlands, conquering the remains of the Adal Sultanate and pushing deep into Ethiopia. The Portuguese presence also increased, while the Ottomans began to push into what is now Eritrea, creating the Habeshe Alad. The Portuguese brought modern weapons and Baroque architecture to Ethiopia, and in 1622 converted the Emperor Susen Yozai to Catholicism, sparking a civil war which ended in his abdication and an expulsion of all Catholics from Ethiopia. A new capital was established at Gondor in 1632, and a period of peace and prosperity ensued until the country was split apart by warlords in the 18th century during the Zemin Mesafid. Ethiopia was reunified in 1855 under Chuo Droz II, beginning Ethiopia's modern history. Ethiopia began to go through a slow modernization process under a leadership of Johannes IV, and defended itself from an Egyptian invasion in 1874. He was killed in action in 1889. Under Menelik II, Ethiopia expanded to the south and east, through the conquest of the western Oromo. Nonsho Noromo. C. Dharma, Guraj, Walaita, and other groups, resulting in the borders of modern Ethiopia. Ethiopia defeated an Italian invasion in 1896 and came to be recognized as a legitimate state by European powers. A more rapid modernization took place under Menelik II and Hail Selassie. Italy launched a second invasion in 1935. From October 1935, May 1940, Ethiopia was under Italian military occupation. A joint force of British and Ethiopian rebels managed to drive the Italians out of the country in 1941, and Hail Selassie was returned to the throne. Ethiopia and Eritrea united in a federation, but when Hail Selassie ended the federation in 1961 and made Eritrea a province of Ethiopia, a war for Eritrean independence occurred, lasting until 1991. Hail Selassie was overthrown in 1974 and the militaristic Derg regime came to power. In 1977 Somalia invaded, trying to annex the Ogaden region, but were pushed back by Ethiopian, Soviet, and Cuban forces. In 1977 and 1978 the government tortured or killed hundreds of thousands of suspected enemies in the Red Harem. 
Ethiopia experienced famine in 1984 that killed one million people and civil war that resulted in the fall of the Durg in 1991. This resulted in the establishment of the Federal Democratic Republic under Miles Zenawi. Ethiopia remains impoverished, but its economy has become one of the world's fastest growing. Part 1, Timeline Timeline graphic removed. Unsuitable for speech. Timeline graphic removed. Unsuitable for speech. Part 2, Prehistory. It was not until 1963 that evidence of the presence of ancient hominids was discovered in Ethiopia, many years after similar such discoveries had been made in neighboring Kenya and Tanzania. The discovery was made by Gerard Decker, a Dutch hydrologist, who found Achaean stone tools that were over a million years old at Kela. Since then many important finds have propelled Ethiopia to the forefront of pillar ontology. The oldest hominid discovered to date in Ethiopia is the 4.2 million year old Ardipithecus ramirdis Ardi. Found by Tim D. White in 1994. The most well-known hominid discovery is Lucy, found in the Awash Valley of Ethiopia's Afar region in 1974 by Donald Johansson, and is one of the most complete and best preserved adult Australopithecine fossils ever uncovered. Lucy's taxonomic name, Australopithecus afarensis, means southern ape of Afar, and refers to the Ethiopian region where the discovery was made. Lucy is estimated to have lived 3.2 million years ago. There have been many other notable fossil findings in the country. Near Gona stone tools were uncovered in 1992 that were 2.52 million years old. These are the oldest such tools ever discovered anywhere in the world. In 2010 fossilized animal bones, that were 3.4 million years old were found with stone tool inflicted marks on them in the lower Awash Valley by an international team, led by Shannon McFerrin, which is the oldest evidence of stone tool use ever found anywhere in the world. In 2004 fossils found near the Omo River at Kibish by Richard Leakey in 1967 were redated to 195,000 years old, the oldest date in East Africa for modern Homo sapiens. Homo sapiens at all too? found in the middle awash in Ethiopia in 1997, lived about 160,000 years ago. Part 3, Bronze Age Contacts with Egypt. The earliest records of Ethiopia appear in ancient Egypt, during the Old Kingdom period. Egyptian traders from about 3000 BC who refer to land south of Nubia or Kush's Punt and Yam. The ancient Egyptians were in possession of Mur, found in Punt, which Richard Pankhurst interprets to indicate trade between the two countries was extant from ancient Egypt's beginnings. Pharaonic records indicate this possession of Mur as early as the first and second dynasties. 3407 to 2888 BC which was also a prized product of the Horn of Africa region. Inscriptions and pictorial reliefs also indicate ivory, panther and other animal skins, myrrh trees and ostrich feathers from the African coastal belt, and in the 4th Egyptian dynasty. 2789 to 2767 BC. A Pontite is mentioned to be in the service of the son of Cheops, the builder of the Great Pyramid. J. H. Breasted posited that this early trade relationship could have been realized through overland trade down the Nile and its tributaries. That is, the Blue Nile and Atbara. The Greek historian and geographer Agath Archides had documented seafaring among the early Egyptians, during the prosperous period of the Old Kingdom, between the 30th and 25th centuries BC. The river routes were kept in order, and Egyptian ships sailed the Red Sea as far as the Mer country. The first known voyage to Punt occurred in the 25th century BC under the reign of Pharaoh Zahur. The most famous expedition to Punt, however, comes during the reign of Queen Hatshepsut probably around 1495 BC, 
as the expedition was recorded in detailed reliefs on the temple of Deir el Bari at Thebes. The inscriptions depict a trading group bringing back myrrh trees, sacks of myrrh, elephant tusks, incense, gold, various fragmented wood, and exotic animals. Detailed information about these two nations is sparse, and there are many theories concerning their locations and the ethnic relationship of their peoples. The Egyptians sometimes called the land of Punt, God's land, due to the large quantities of gold, ivory, and myrrh that could be easily obtained. Evidence of Nakadan contacts include obsidian from Ethiopia and the Aegean. Part 4, Antiquity Part 4, Antiquity Chapter 1, Etymology Ancient Greek historians such as Herodotus and Diodorus Siculus used the word Ethiopia to refer to the peoples living immediately to the south of ancient Egypt, specifically the area now known as the ancient kingdom of Kush, now a part of modern Nubia in Egypt and Sudan, as well as all of sub-Saharan Africa in general. Ethiopia roughly translates to country of burnt faces. In ancient times the name Ethiopia was primarily used to refer to the modern-day nation of Sudan based in the Upper Nile Valley south of Egypt, also called Kush, and then secondarily in reference to sub-Saharan Africa in general. Reference to the Kingdom of Aksum designated as Ethiopia dates only as far back as the first half of 4th century following the 4th century invasion of Kush in Sudan by the Aksumite Empire. Earlier inscription of Azanat Habashit. The source for Abyssa Emiya in Gez, South Arabian alphabet, was then translated in Greek as Ethiopia. The state of Sheba mentioned in the Old Testament is sometimes believed to have been in Ethiopia, but more often is placed in Yemen. According to the Ethiopian narrative, best represented in the Kebronegist, the Queen of Sheba slept with King Solomon, resulting in a child, named Ibn Melek later Emperor Menelik I. When he was of age, Menelik returned to Israel to see his father, who sent with him the son of Zadok to accompany him with a replica of the Ark of the Covenant. Ethiosemitic, Tabat. On his return with some of the Israelite priests, however, he found that Zadok's son had stolen the real Ark of the Covenant. Some believe the Ark is still being preserved today at the Church of Our Lady Mary of Zion in Aksum, Ethiopia. The tradition that the Biblical Queen of Sheba was a ruler of Ethiopia who visited King Solomon in Jerusalem in ancient Israel is supported by the 1st century AD Jewish historian Flavius Josephus, who identified Solomon's visitor as a Queen of Egypt and Ethiopia. Part 4, Antiquity Chapter 2. DMT. The first kingdom known to have existed in Ethiopia was the Kingdom of DMT, with its capital at Yeha, where a Saban-style temple was built around 700 BC. It rose to power around the 10th century BC. The DMT kingdom was influenced by the Sabans in Yemen, however it is not known to what extent. While it was once believed that DMT was a Saban colony, it is now believed that Saban influence was minor, limited to a few localities, and disappeared after a few decades or a century, perhaps representing a trading or military colony in some sort of symbiosis or military alliance with the civilization of DMT or some other proto-Axiomite state. Few inscriptions by or about this kingdom survive and very little archaeological work has taken place. As a result, it is not known whether DMT ended as a civilization before Axum's early stages, evolved into the Axumite state, or was one of the smaller states united in the Axumite kingdom possibly around the beginning of the first century. Part 4, Antiquity. Chapter 3, Axum. The first verifiable kingdom of great power to rise in Ethiopia was that of Axum in the first century AD. It was one of many successor kingdoms to DMT and was able to unite the northern Ethiopian highlands beginning around the 1st century BC. They established bases on the northern highlands of the Ethiopian plateau and from there expanded southward. 
the Persian religious figure Mani listed Aksum with Rome, Persia, and China as one of the four great powers of his time. The origins of the Aksumite kingdom are unclear, although experts have offered their speculations about it. Even whom should be considered the earliest known king is contested. Although Carlo Conti Rossini proposed that Zos Karls of Aksum, mentioned in the Peripolis of the Erythra and Sea, should be identified with ones Ahikla mentioned in the Ethiopian king lists. A view embraced by later historians of Ethiopia such as Yuri M. Kovishkinov and Sergei Habel Selassie. GWB. Huntingford argued that Zos Karls was only a subking whose authority was limited to a Ulysses, and that Conti Roerna's identification cannot be substantiated. Inscriptions have been found in southern Arabia celebrating victories over one GDRT, described as Nagashi, of Habashat that is, Abyssinia and Vaxum. Other dated inscriptions are used to determine a Floruit for GDRT. Interpreted as representing a Ge's name such as Gardrat, Jida, Gidurat or Jedara. Around the beginning of the 3rd century, a bronze scepter or wand has been discovered at Atpidira with an inscription mentioning Gedea of Aksum. Coins showing the royal portrait began to be minted under King Endubis toward the end of the 3rd century. Christianity was introduced into the country by Frumentius, who was consecrated first bishop of Ethiopia by St. Athanasius of Alexandria about 330. Frumentius converted as an who left several inscriptions detailing his reign both before and after his conversion. One inscription found at Aksum, states that he conquered the nation of the Bogos, and returned thanks to his father, the god Mars, for his victory. Later inscriptions show Azanus growing attachment to Christianity, and Azanus coins bear this out, shifting from a design with discant crescent to a design with a cross. Expeditions by Ezana into the kingdom of Kushat Mero in Sudan may have brought about its demise, though there is evidence that the kingdom was experiencing a period of decline beforehand. As a result of Ezana's expansions, Aksum bordered the Roman province of Egypt. The degree of Ezana's control over Yemen is uncertain. Though there is little evidence supporting Aksumite control of the region at that time, his title, which includes King of Sub and Saun, Himyar and Tu Raiden. All in modern day Yemen. Along with gold Aksumite coins with the inscriptions, King of the Habshit or Habashite, indicate that Aksum might have retained some legal or actual footing in the area. Toward the close of the 5th century, a great company of monks known as the Nine Saints are believed to have established themselves in the country. Since that time, Monasticism has been a power among the people, and not without its influence on the course of events. The Aksumite kingdom is recorded once again as controlling part if not all of Yemen in the 6th century. Around 523, the Jewish king Tahunuwas came to power in Yemen and, announcing that he would kill all the Christians, attacked an Aksumite garrison at Zafar, burning the city's churches. He then attacked the Christian stronghold of Najran, slaughtering the Christians who would not convert. Emperor Justin I of the Eastern Roman Empire requested that his fellow Christian, Caleb, help fight the Yemenite king, and around 525, Caleb invaded and defeated Tunuwas, appointing his Christian follower Sunuaf at Asharwood as his viceroy. This dating is tentative, however, as the basis of the year 525 for the invasion is based on the death of the ruler of Yemen at the time, who very well could have been Caleb's viceroy. Procopius records that after about five years, Abraha deposed the viceroy and made himself king. Histories 1.20 Despite several attempted invasions across the Red Sea, Caleb was unable to dislodge Abraha, and acquiesced in the change, this was the last time Ethiopian armies left Africa until the 20th century when several units participated in the Korean War. Eventually Caleb abdicated in favor of his son Roeb and retired to a monastery, where he ended his days. Abraha later made peace with Caleb's successor and recognized his suzerainty. 
Despite this reverse, Andres Anna and Caleb the King then was at its height, benefiting from a large trade, which extended as far as India and Salem, and were in constant communication with the Byzantine Empire. Details of the Axumite Kingdom, never abundant, become even more scarce after this point. The last king known to mint coins is Amr, whose coinage refers to the Persian conquest of Jerusalem in 614. An early Muslim tradition is that the Negus Sama offered asylum to a group of Muslims fleeing persecution during Muhammad's life. 615. But Stuart Monroe believes that Aksum had been abandoned as the capital by then although Kobishkanov states that Ethiopian raiders plagued the Red Sea, preying on Arabian ports at least as late as 702. Some people believed the end of the Aksumite kingdom is as much of a mystery as its beginning. Lacking a detailed history, the kingdom's fall has been attributed to a persistent drought, overgrazing, deforestation, plague, a shift in trade routes that reduced the importance of the Red Sea. Or a combination of these factors. Monroe Hay cites the Muslim historian Abu Jafar al Khwarazmi slash Khwarazmi, who wrote before 833, as stating that the capital of the Kingdom of Habash was Jama, unless Jama is a nickname for Aksum. Hypothetically from Gez, Goma, remarkable, revered. The capital had moved from Maxim to a new site, yet undiscovered. Part 5, Middle Ages. Part 5, Middle Ages. Chapter 1, Zagu Dynasty. About 1000. Presumably C. 960, though the date is uncertain. A non-Christian princess, Yodit. Gudit, a play on Yodit meaning evil, conspired to murder all the members of the royal family and establish herself as monarch. According to legends, during the execution of the royals, an infant heir of the Axumite monarch was carted off by some faithful adherents and conveyed to Shia, where his authority was acknowledged. Concurrently, Yodit reigned for 40 years over the rest of the kingdom and transmitted the crown to her descendants. Though parts of this story were most likely made up by the Solomonic dynasty to legitimize its rule, it is known that a female ruler did conquer the country about this time. At one point during the next century, the last of Yodit's successors were overthrown by an Agul lord named Mara Taklahama Not, who founded the Zagu dynasty named after the Agor people who ruled during this time, and married a female descendant of the Aksumite monarchs. Son-in-law, or previous ruler, exactly when the new dynasty came to power is unknown, as is the number of kings in the dynasty. The new Zagu dynasty established its capital at Roha, also called Defa, where they built a series of monolithic churches. These structures are traditionally ascribed to the King Gebemeskal Lalibela, with the city being renamed Lalibela in his honor, though in truth some of them were built before and after him. The architecture of the Zagu shows a continuation of earlier Axiomite traditions, as can be seen at Lalibela and at Yemrahana Cresto's church. The building of rock-hewn churches, which first appeared in the late Axumite era and continued into the Solomonic dynasty, reached its peak under the Zagu. The Zagu dynasty controlled a smaller area than the Aksumites or the Solomonic dynasty, with its gore in the last region. The Zagu seem to have ruled over a mostly peaceful state with a flourishing urban culture, in contrast to the more warlike Solomonids with their mobile capitals. David Buxton remarked that the Zagu achieved a degree of stability and technical advancement seldom equaled in Abyssinian history. The church and state were very closely linked, and they may have had a more theocratic society than the Aksumites or Solomonids, with three Zagu kings being canonized as saints and one possibly being an ordained priest. Chapter 1, Zagu Dynasty. Section 1, Foreign Affairs. Unlike the Aksumites, the Zagu were very isolated from the other Christian nations, although they did maintain a degree of contact through Jerusalem and Cairo. 
Like many other nations and denominations, the Ethiopian church maintained a series of small chapels and even an annex at the Church of the Holy Sepulchre. Saladin, after retaking the Holy City in 1187, expressly invited the Ethiopian monks to return and even exempted Ethiopian pilgrims from the pilgrim tax. His two edicts provide evidence of Ethiopia's contact with these crusader states during this period. It was during this period that the Ethiopian king Ebemeskal Lalibela ordered the construction of the legendary rock-hewn churches of Lalibela. Later, as the Crusades were dying out in the early 14th century, the Ethiopian king Wedemarad dispatched a 30-man mission to Europe, where they traveled to Rome to meet the Pope and then, since the medieval papacy was in schism, they traveled to Avignon to meet the antipope. During this trip, the Ethiopian mission also traveled to France, Spain and Portugal in the hopes of building an alliance against the Muslim states then threatening Ethiopia's existence. Plans were even drawn up of a two-pronged invasion of Egypt with the French king, but nothing ever came of the talks, although this brought Ethiopia back to Europe's attention, leading to expansion of European influence when the Portuguese explorers reached the Indian Ocean. Part 5, Middle Ages, Chapter 2, Early Solomonic Period, 1270-1529 Around 1270, a new dynasty was established in the Abyssinian Highlands under Yakuno Amluk who deposed the last of the Zagu kings and married one of his daughters. According to legends, the new dynasty were male line descendants of Aksumite monarchs, now recognized as the continuing Solomonic dynasty. The kingdom being thus restored to the biblical royal house. This legend was created to legitimize the Solomonic dynasty and was written down in the 14th century in the Kebernegast, an account of the origins of the Solomonic dynasty. Under the Solomonic dynasty, the chief provinces became Tigray. Northern what is now Amharu? Central and Shia. Southern. The seat of government, or rather of ovalship, had usually been in Amhara or Shia, the ruler of which, calling himself Nfgus Anagust, exacted tribute, when he could, from the other provinces. The title of Nfgus Anagust was to a considerable extent based on their alleged direct descent from Solomon and the Queen of Sheba. But it is needless to say that in many, if not in most, cases their success was due more to the force of their arms than to the purity of their lineage. Under the early Solomonic dynasty Ethiopia engaged in military reforms and imperial expansion which left it dominating the Horn of Africa, especially under the rule of Amdasayan I. There was also great artistic and literary advancement at this time, but also a decline in urbanization as the Solomonic emperors didn't have any fixed capital, but rather moved around the empire in mobile camps. Under the early Solomonic dynasty monasticism grew strongly. The abbot Abluo Statuos created a new order called the Uostathians who called for reforms in the church, including observance of the Sabbath, but was persecuted for his views and eventually forced into exile, eventually dying in Armenia. His zealous followers, also persecuted, formed isolated communities in Tigray. The movement grew strong enough that the Emperor Dewitai, after first trying to crush the movement, legalized their observance of the Sabbath and proselytization of their faith. Finally under Zara Yukub a compromise was made between the new Egyptian bishops and the Uostathians at the Council of Mitmak in 1450, restoring unity to the Ethiopian Church. Chapter 2, Early Solomonic Period Section 1, Relations with Europe and Prester John. An interesting side effect of Ethiopian Christianity was the way it intersected with a belief that had long prevailed in Europe of the existence of a Christian kingdom in the Far East, whose monarch was known as Prester John. Originally thought to have been in the Orient, eventually the search for Prester John's mythical kingdom focused on Africa and particularly, the Christian Empire in Ethiopia. This was first noticed when Zara Yacob sent delegates to the Council of Florence in order to establish ties with the papacy and Western Christianity. 
they were confused when they arrived and council prelates insisted on calling their monarch Prester John, trying to explain that nowhere in Zara Yakub's list of regnal names did that title occur. However, the delegates' admonitions did little to stop Europeans from referring to the monarch as their mythical Christian king, Prester John. Towards the close of the 15th century the Portuguese missions into Ethiopia began. Among others engaged in this search was Pero Darko Vilha, who arrived in Ethiopia in 1490, and, believing that he had at length reached the far-famed kingdom, presented to the NFG USA Nagist of the country. S. Kender at the time. A letter from his master the King of Portugal, addressed to Prester John. Covilha would establish positive relations between the two states and go on to remain there for many years. In 1507, the emperor sent an Armenian named Matthew to the King of Portugal to request his aid against the Muslims. In 1520, the Portuguese fleet, with Matthew on board, entered the Red Sea in compliance with this request, and an embassy from the fleet visited the emperor, Lebned Engel, and remained in Ethiopia for about six years. One of this embassy was Father Francisco Alvarez, who wrote one of the earliest accounts of the country. Chapter 2. Early Solomonic Period Section 2. The Abyssinian Adal War. 1529-1543. Between 1528 and 1540, armies of Muslims, under the Imam Ahmad ibn Ibrahim al-Ghazi, entered Ethiopia from the Low Country to the southeast, and overran the Abyssinian Kingdom, obliging the Emperor to take refuge in the mountain fastnesses. In this remote location, the ruler again turned to the Portuguese. Joao Bermudes, a subordinate member of the mission of 1520, who had remained in the country after the departure of the embassy, was, according to his own statement, which is untrustworthy, ordained successor to the Abuna, Archbishop, and sent to Lisbon. Bermudes certainly came to Europe, but with what credentials is not known. In response to Bermude's message, a Portuguese fleet under the command of Estevão da Gama was sent from India and arrived at Massar in February 1541. Here he received an ambassador from the Emperor beseeching him to send help against the Muslims, and in the July following a force of 400 musketeers, under the command of Cristóvão da Gama, younger brother of the Admiral, marched into the interior and being joined by native troops were at first successful against the enemy, but they were subsequently defeated at the Battle of Wofla. The 28th of August 1542. And their commander captured and executed. On February the 21st, 1543, however, Al-Ghazi was shot and killed in the Battle of Wainadaga and his forces were totally routed. After this, Quarrels arose between the Emperor and Bermudes, who had returned to Ethiopia with Gama and now urged the Emperor to publicly profess his obedience to Rome. This the Emperor refused to do, and at length Bermudes was obliged to make his way out of the country. Part 5, Middle Ages, Chapter 3, Oromo Movements The Oromo Migrations were a series of expansions in the 16th and 17th centuries by the Oromo people from southern areas of Ethiopia to more northern regions. The migrations had a severe impact on the Solomonic dynasty of Abyssa Emea, as well as being the death blow to the recently defeated Adal Sultanate. Part 6. Gondorin Period. Gondor as a third permanent capital. After Aksum and Lalibela of the Christian Kingdom was founded by Fasilades in 1636. It was the most important center of commerce for the kingdom. Part 6 Gondorine Period. Chapter 1 Early Gondor Period. 1632 to 1769. The Jesuits who had accompanied or followed the Gama expedition into Ethiopia, and fixed their headquarters at Fremona, near Adwa, were oppressed and neglected, but not actually expelled. 
In the beginning of the 17th century Father Pedro Paez arrived at Fremona, a man of great tact and judgment, who soon rose into high favor at court, and won over the emperor to his faith. He directed the erection of churches, palaces and bridges in different parts of the country, and carried out many useful works. His successor Afonso Mendes was less tactful, and excited the feelings of the people against him and his fellow Europeans. Upon the death of Emperor Susenyos and accession of his son Facilides in 1633, the Jesuits were expelled and the native religion restored to official status. Facilides made Gondor his capital and built a castle the which would grow into the castle complex known as the Facile Gebi, or Royal Enclosure. Facilides also constructed several churches in Gondor, many bridges across the country, and expanded the Church of Our Lady Mary of Zion in Exum. During this time of religious strife Ethiopian philosophy flourished, and it was during this period that the philosophers Zera Jacob and Valda Haywad lived. Zera Jacob is known for his treatise on religion, morality, and reason, known as Hatata. Chapter 1, Early Gondor Period Section 1, Ausa Sultanate The Sultanate of Ausa Afar Sultanate Succeeded the earlier imamate of Ausa. The latter polity had come into existence in 1577, when Muhammad Jarsan moved his capital from Harar to Ausa with the split of the Adal Sultanate into Ausa and the Harari city-state. At some point after 1672, Ausa declined and temporarily came to an end in conjunction with Imam Umar Din and Adam's recorded ascension to the throne. The Sultanate was subsequently re-established by Kedafu around the year 1734, and was thereafter ruled by his Mudato dynasty. The primary symbol of the Sultan was a silver baton, which was considered to have magical properties. Part 6 Gondorine Period. Chapter 2. Zemin Mesafant. This era was, on one hand, a religious conflict between settling Muslims and traditional Christians, between nationalities they represented, and, on the other hand, between feudal lords on power over the central government. Some historians date the murder of Iyasu I, and the resultant decline in the prestige of the dynasty, as the beginning of the Ethiopian Zemin Mesafant. Era of the Princes A time of disorder when the power of the monarchy was eclipsed by the power of local warlords. Nobles came to abuse their positions by making emperors, and encroached upon the succession of the dynasty, by candidates among the nobility itself, for example. On the death of Emperor Tuaflos, the chief nobles of Ethiopia feared that the cycle of vengeance that had characterized the reigns of Tuaflos and Tekel Haimanotai would continue if a member of the Solomonic dynasty were picked for the throne, so they selected one of their own, Yastos to be Negusanagist, King of Kings. However his tenure was brief. Iyasu II ascended the throne as a child. His mother, Empress Mentwab played a major role in Yasa's reign, as well as in that of her grandson Iyoas II. Mentwab had herself crowned as co-ruler, becoming the first woman to be crowned in this manner in Ethiopian history. Empress Mentwab was crowned co-ruler upon the succession of her son. A first for a woman in Ethiopia. In 1730, and held unprecedented power over government during his reign. Her attempt to continue in this role following the death of her son 1755 led her into conflict with Wibit. Wilit Bursabe. His widow, who believed that it was her turn to preside at the court of her own son Ayoas. The conflict between these two queens led to Mentwab summoning her Quaran relatives and their forces to Gundor to support her. Wiubit responded by summoning her own Oromo relatives and their considerable forces from Yeju. The treasure of the empire being allegedly penniless on the death of Iyasu, it suffered further from ethnic conflict between nationalities that had been part of the empire for hundreds of years. The Agor, Amharans, Showans, and Tigrians. And the Oromo newcomers, 
Mentorab's attempt to strengthen ties between the monarchy and the Oromo by arranging the marriage of her son to the daughter of an Oromo chieftain backfired in the long run. Iyasu II gave precedence to his mother and allowed her every prerogative as a crowned co-ruler, while his wife Wiyubit suffered in obscurity. Wiyubit waited for the accession of her own son to make a bid for the power wielded for so long by Mentwab and her relatives from Gwara. When Iyos assumed the throne upon his father's sudden death, the aristocrats of Gondor were stunned to find that he more readily spoke in the Oromo language rather than in Amharic, and tended to favor his mother's Yeju relatives over the Quarans of his grandmother's family. Iyos further increased the favor given to the Oromo when adult. On the death of the Rasavamhara, he attempted to promote his uncle Lubo governor of that province, but the outcry led his advisor World Lul to convince him to change his mind. It is believed that the power struggle between the Quarans led by the Empress Mentwab and the Yeju Oromos led by the Emperor's mother Wiyubit was about to erupt into an armed conflict. Ras Mikhail Sehul was summoned to mediate between the two camps. He arrived and shrewdly maneuvered to sideline the two queens and their supporters making a bid for power for himself. Mikhail settled soon as the leader of Amharic to Green. Christian. Camp of the Struggle. The reign of Eaus reign becomes a narrative of the struggle between the powerful Ras Mikhail Sehul and the Oromo relatives of Iyoas. As Iyoas increasingly favored Oromo leaders like Fasil, his relations with Mikhail Sehul deteriorated. Eventually Mikhail Sehul deposed the Emperor Iyoas. The 7th of May 1769. One week later, Mikhail Sehul had him killed. Although the details of his death are contradictory, the result was clear. For the first time an emperor had lost his throne in a means other than his own natural death, death in battle, or voluntary abdication. Mikhail Sehul had compromised the power of the emperor, and from this point forward it lay ever more openly in the hands of the great nobles and military commanders. This point of time has been regarded as one start of the era of the princes. An aged and infirm imperial uncle prince was enthroned as Emperor Johannes II. Ras Mikhail soon had him murdered, and underage Tekel Haymanot II was elevated to the throne. This bit religious conflict contributed to hostility toward foreign Christians and Europeans, which persisted into the 20th century and was a factor in Ethiopia's isolation until the mid-19th century, when the first British mission, sent in 1805 to conclude an alliance with Ethiopia and obtain a port on the Red Sea in case France conquered Egypt. The success of this mission opened Ethiopia to many more travelers, missionaries and merchants of all countries, and the stream of Europeans continued until well into Chuodros' reign. This isolation was pierced by very few European travelers. One was the French physician C.J. Bonset, who went there in 1698, via Sarah and the Blue Nile. After him James Bruce entered the country in 1769, with the object of discovering the sources of the Nile, which he was convinced lay in Ethiopia. Accordingly, leaving Massawa in September 1769, he traveled via Aksum to Gondor, where he was well received by Emperor Tekel Haymanot II. He accompanied the king on a warlike expedition round Lake Dana, moving south round the eastern shore, crossing the Blue Nile. A bay Close to its point of issue from the lake and returning via the western shore, Bruce subsequently returned to Egypt at the end of 1772 by way of the upper Atbara, through the kingdom of Senat, the Nile, and the Korosko Desert. During the 18th century the most prominent rulers were the Emperor Darwit II of Gondor. Died May 18, 1721. Amma Iyasis of Shia, who consolidated his kingdom and founded Ankoba, and Tekel Shiorgis of Amhara, the last mentioned is famous as having been elevated to the throne altogether six times and also deposed six times. The first years of the 19th century were disturbed by fierce campaigns between Ras Gugsa of Begumda and Ras World Selassie of Tigray, who fought over control of the figurehead Emperor Egwalesian. World Selassie was eventually the victor, 
and practically ruled the whole country till his death in 1816 at the age of 80. Dejar's Muxabigardis of a game succeeded Wold Selassie in 1817, through force of arms, to become warlord of Taig. Part 7, Modern Part 7, Modern Chapter 1, 1855 to 1936 Under the Emperor's Chuodros II 1855 to 1868 Johannes IV 1872 to 1889 And Menelik II 1889 to 1913 the empire began to emerge from its isolation. Under Emperor Tuodros II, the age of the princes, Zemin Mesafint, was brought to an end. Chapter 1, 1855 to 1936. Section 1, Tuodros II and Tekel Jorgis II. 1855 to 1872. Emperor Tuodros, or Theodore, to was born Lip Kassa in Kora in 1818. His father was a small local chief and his relative, possibly uncle. Dejars Kinfu was governor of the provinces of Dembia, Kora and Chelga between Lake Dana and the northwestern frontier. Kassa lost his inheritance upon the death of Kinfu while he was still a young boy. After receiving a traditional education in a local monastery, he went off to lead a band of bandits that roved the country in a Robin Hood-like existence. His exploits became widely known, and his band of followers grew steadily until he led a formidable army. He came to the notice of the ruling regent, Ras Ali, and his mother Empress Menin Libanamid. Wife of the Emperor Johannes II I. In order to bind him to them, the Empress arranged for Kassa to marry Ali's daughter. He turned his attention to conquering the remaining chief divisions of the country, Gorjum, Tigre and Shia, which still remained and subdued. His relations with his father-in-law and grandmother-in-law deteriorated however, and he soon took up arms against them and their vassals, and was successful. On February the 11th, 1855, Kassa deposed the last of the Gundarine puppet emperors, and was crowned Negusanagist of Ethiopia under the name of Chuodros II. He soon after advanced against Shia with a large army. Chief of the notables opposing him was its King Hale Melkot, a descendant of Meridars Mukasvawasan. Dissensions broke out among the Shiwans, and after a desperate and futile attack on Chuodros at Dabra Burhan, Hale Melkot died of illness, nominating with his last breath his 11-year-old son as successor. November 1855 Under the name Niga Salmeri Arm The future Emperor Menelik II Darj, Hale Melkot's brother, and a Tobezabit Ashuan noble, took charge of the young prince, but after a hard fight with Ainjada, the Shewans were obliged to capitulate. Salmeri Arm was handed over to the Emperor Tuodoros and taken to Gondor. He was trained there in Chuodros service, and then placed in comfortable detention at the fortress of Magdala. Chuodros afterwards devoted himself to modernizing and centralizing the legal and administrative structure of his kingdom, against the resistance of his governors. Salmeri Arm of Shia was married to Chuodros II's daughter Latash. In 1865, Salmeri Arm escaped from Magdala, abandoning his wife, and arrived in Shia, and was there acclaimed as Negus. Tuodros forged an alliance between Britain and Ethiopia, but as explained in the next section, he committed suicide after a military defeat by the British. On the death of Tuodros, many Shiwans, including Ras Daj, were released, and the young Negus of Shia began to feel himself strong enough, after a few preliminary minor campaigns to undertake offensive operations against the northern princes. However, these projects were of little avail, for Ras Kassai of Tigre had by this time. 1872. Risen to supreme power in the north. Proclaiming himself Negusanagist under the name of Johannes IV. 
or John IV. He forced Salmeri Arm to acknowledge his overlordship. In early 1868, the British force seeking duo Drose surrender, after he refused to release imprisoned British subjects, arrived on the coast of Masawa. The British and Dajars Mukasa came to an agreement in which Kasa would let the British pass through Tigre. The British were going to Magdala which duo Drose had made his capital in exchange for money and weapons. Surely enough, when the British completed their mission and were leaving the country, they rewarded Kassa for his cooperation with artillery, muskets, rifles, and munitions, all in all worth approximately £500,000. This formidable gift came in handy one in July 1871 the current Emperor, Emperor Teklshi August II, attacked Kassa at his capital in Adwa, for Kassa had refused to be named Ras or pay tribute. Although Kassa's army was outnumbered 12,000 to the Emperor's 60,000, Kassa's army was equipped with more modern weapons and better trained. At battle's end, 40% of the Emperor's men had been captured. The Emperor was imprisoned and would die a year later. Six months later on the 21st of January 1872, Kassa became the new Emperor under the name Johannes IV. Chapter 1, 1855 to 1936. Section 2, Johannes IV. 1872 to 1889. Ethiopia was never colonized by a European power, but was occupied by Italians in 1936. See below. However, Several colonial powers had interests and designs on Ethiopia in the context of the 19th century scramble for Africa. When Victoria, Queen of the United Kingdom, in 1867 failed to answer a letter to Odros II of Ethiopia had sent her, he took it as an insult and imprisoned several British residents, including the consul. An army of 12,000 was sent from Bombay to Ethiopia to rescue the captured nationals, under the command of Sir Robert Napier. The Ethiopians were defeated, and the British stormed the fortress of Magdala, now known as Amber Mariam. On April 13, 1868, when the Emperor heard that the gate had fallen, he fired a pistol into his mouth and killed himself. Sir Robert Napier was raised to the peerage and given the title of Lord Napier of Magdala. The Italians now came on the scene. Asa, a port near the southern entrance of the Red Sea, had been bought from the local sultan in March 1870 by an Italian company, which, after acquiring more land in 1879 and 1880, was bought out by the Italian government in 1882. In this year Count Pietro Antonelli was dispatched to Shia in order to improve the prospects of the colony by treaties with Salmeri Arm of Shia and the Sultan of Aousa. In April 1888 the Italian forces, numbering over 20,000 men, came in contact with the Ethiopian army, but negotiations took the place of fighting, with the result that both forces retired, the Italians only leaving some 5,000 troops in Eritrea, later to become an Italian colony. Meanwhile, the Emperor Johannes IV had been engaged with the dervishes, who had in the meantime become masters of the Egyptian Sudan, and in 1887 a great battle ensued at Galabat, in which the dervishes, under Zeki Tumul, were beaten. But a stray bullet struck the king, and the Ethiopians decided to retire. The king died during the night, and his body fell into the hands of the enemy. March 9, 1889 When the news of Johannes' death reached Salmeri Arm of Shia, he proclaimed himself Emperor Menelik II of Ethiopia, and received the submission of Begumda, Gorjan, the Yeju Oromo, and Tigray. Chapter 1, 1855-1936 Section 3 Menelik II 1889-1913 On May 2 of that same year, Emperor Menelik signed the Treaty of Washale with the Italians, granting them a portion of northern Ethiopia, the area that would later be Eritrea and part of the province of Tigray in return for the promise of 30,000 rifles, 
ammunition, and cannons. The Italians notified the European powers that this treaty gave them a protectorate over all of Ethiopia. Menelik protested, showing that the Amharic version of the treaty said no such thing, but his protests were ignored. On March 1, 1896, Ethiopia's conflict with the Italians, the First Italo-Ethiopian War, was resolved by the complete defeat of the Italian armed forces at the Battle of Adoa. A provisional treaty of peace was concluded at Addis Ababa on October 26, 1896, which acknowledged the independence of Ethiopia. Menelik granted the first railway concession, from the coast at Djibouti. French Somaliland To the interior, to a French company in 1894. The railway was completed to Diadowa, 45 kilometers, 28 miles, from Harit, by the last day of 1902. Under the reign of Menelik, beginning in the 1880s, Ethiopia set off from the central province of Shoa, to incorporate the lands and people of the south, east and west into an empire. The people incorporated were the Western Oromo, non shon Oromo, C. Dharma, Guraj, Walaita and other groups. He began expanding his kingdom to the south and east, expanding in two areas that had never been under his rule, resulting in the borders of Ethiopia of today. He did this with the help of Rasko Banashu on Oromo militia. During the conquest of the Oromo, the Ethiopian army carried mass atrocities against the Oromo population including mass mutilation, mass killings and large-scale slavery. Some estimates for the number of people killed as a result of the conquest go into the millions. Large-scale atrocities were also committed against the Dizi people and the people of the Kaficho Kingdom. Chapter 1 1855-1936. Section 4. E. Yasuvi, Zordito and Hail Selassie. 1913-1936. When Menelik II died, his grandson, Luyasu, succeeded to the throne but soon lost support because of his Muslim ties. He was deposed in 1916 by the Christian nobility, and Menelik's daughter, Zordi II, was made empress. Her cousin, Rastafari Makanan, was made regent and successor to the throne. Upon the death of Empress Zordi II in 1930, Rastafari Makanan, adopting the throne name Hail Selassie, was crowned Emperor Hail Selassie I of Ethiopia. His full title was, His Imperial Majesty Hail Selassie I, Conquering Lion of the Tribe of Judah, King of Kings of Ethiopia and Elect of God. Following the death of Abu Jafar II of Jima, Emperor Hail Selassie seized the opportunity to annex Jima. In 1932, the Kingdom of Jima was formally absorbed into Ethiopia. During the reorganization of the provinces in 1942, Jima vanished into Kaffir province. Part 7, Modern. Chapter 2, Italian Occupation. 1936-1941 Emperor Hail Selassie's reign was interrupted in 1935 when Italian forces invaded and occupied Ethiopia. The Italian army, under the direction of dictator Benito Mussolini, invaded Ethiopian territory on October 2, 1935. They occupied the capital Addis Ababa on May 5. Emperor Hail Selassie pleaded to the League of Nations for aid in resisting the Italians. Nevertheless, the country was formally annexed on May 9, 1936, and the Emperor went into exile. Citation needed. The war was full of cruelty. The Ethiopians used dum-dum bullets. Prohibited by the Hague Convention of 1899, Declaration of Comma 3 and the Italians used gas. Prohibited under the Geneva Protocol of 1922. Citation needed. Many Ethiopians died in the invasion. The Negus claimed that more than 275,000 Ethiopian fighters were killed compared to only 1,537 Italians, 
while the Italian authorities estimated that 16,000 Ethiopians and 2,700 Italians, including Italian colonial troops, died in battle. Italy in 1936 requested the League of Nations to recognize the annexation of Ethiopia, all member nations, including Britain and France, with the exception of the Soviet Union, voted to support it. Citation needed. The King of Italy, Victor Emmanuel II, was crowned Emperor of Ethiopia and the Italians created an Italian Empire in Africa. Italian East Africa. With Ethiopia, Eritrea and Italian Somalia, in 1937 Mussolini boasted that, with his conquest of Ethiopia, citation needed. Finally Adua was avenged and that he had abolished slavery in Ethiopia. The order to abolish slavery was enforced. Citation needed. Capillary in Ethiopia by the local administrations such as by Debono in Tigro Tomelini in Agaro. Transitional measures were necessary due to the huge number of slaves present in the country. Citation needed. Citation needed. The Italians invested substantively in Ethiopian infrastructure development. They created the Imperial Road between Addis Ababa and Masoer, the Addis Ababa Mogadishu and the Addis Ababa Asab. 900 kilometers of railways were reconstructed or initiated. Citation needed. Like the railway between Addis Ababa and Asab. Dams and hydroelectric. Citation needed. Plants were built and many public and private companies were established in the underdeveloped country. The most important were, Company per il Coto d'Etiopia, Gotten Industry, Cemetery d'Etiopia, Cement Industry. Citation needed. Compagnia Etiopica Minor Area, Minerals Industry, Impresa Letrish d'Etiopia, Electricity Industry Compagnia Etiopica Degli Esplosivi Armament Industry Trasporti Automobilistici Sidao Mechanic and Transport Industry Citation needed Citation needed much of these improvements were part of a plan to bring half a million Italians to colonize the Ethiopian Plato's. Citation needed. In October 1939 the Italian colonists in Ethiopia numbered 35,441, of whom 30,232 male. 85.3 percent. And 5,209 female. 14.7% Citation needed. Most of them living in urban areas. Only 3,200 Italian farmers moved to colonize farm areas, where they were under sporadic attack by pro hail Selassie guerrillas. Part 7, Modern. Chapter 3, World War II. In spring 1941 the Italians were defeated by British and Allied forces, including Ethiopian forces. On May 5, 1941, Emperor Hail Selassie re-entered Addis Ababa and returned to the throne. The Italians, after their final stand at Gondor in November 1941, conducted a guerrilla war in Ethiopia that lasted until summer 1943. After the defeat of Italy, Ethiopia annexed the former Italian colony of Eritrea. Part 7, Modern. Chapter 4, Post-World War II Period. 1941-1974. After World War II, Emperor Hail Selassie made numerous efforts to promote the modernization of his nation. The country's first important school of higher education, University College of Addis Ababa, was founded in 1950, 
the Constitution of 1931 was replaced with the 1955 Constitution which expanded the powers of the Parliament. While improving diplomatic ties with the United States, Hale Selassie also sought to improve the nation's relationship with other African nations. To do this, in 1963, he helped to found the Organization of African Unity. In 1961 the Thirty Year Eritrean struggle for independence began, following the Ethiopian Emperor Hale Selassie's dissolution of the Federation and shutting down the Eritrean Parliament. The Emperor declared Eritrea the 14th province of Ethiopia in 1962. The Niger suffered criticism due to the expenses involved in fighting the nationalist forces. By the early 1970s Emperor Hale Selassie's advanced age was becoming apparent, as Paul B. Hens explains, most Ethiopians thought in terms of personalities, not ideology, and out of long habits still looked to Hale Selassie as the initiator of change, the source of status and privilege, and the arbiter of demands for resources and attention among competing groups. The nature of the succession, and of the desirability of the imperial monarchy in general, were in dispute amongst the Ethiopian people. Perceptions of this war as imperialist were among the primary causes of the growing Ethiopian Marxist movement. In the early 1970s, the Ethiopian communists received the support of the Soviet Union under the leadership of Leonid Brezhnev. This help led to the 1974 Marxist coup of Mengistu. The government's failure to effect significant economic and political reforms over the previous 14 years created a climate of unrest. Combined with rising inflation, corruption, a famine that affected several provinces, especially Wilo and Tigray, but was concealed from the outside world, and the growing discontent of urban interest groups, the country was ripe for revolution. The unrest that began in January 1974 became an outburst of general discontent. The Ethiopian military, with assistance from the Comintern, began to both organize and incite a full-fledged revolution. Part 7, Modern. Chapter 5, Communist Period. 1974-1991 After a period of civil unrest that began in February 1974, a provisional administrative council of soldiers, known as the Derg. Committee seized power from the aging Emperor Hale Selassie I on September 12, 1974, and installed a government that was socialist in name and military in style. The Derg summarily executed 59 members of the former government, including two former prime ministers and crown councillors, court officials, ministers, and generals. Emperor Hale Selassie died on August 22, 1975. He was allegedly strangled in the basement of his palace or smothered with a wet pillow. Lieutenant Colonel Mengis II Hill Mariam assumed power as head of state and Derg chairman, after having his two predecessors killed, as well as tens of thousands of other suspected opponents. The new Marxist government undertook socialist reforms, including nationalization of landlords' property and the church as property. Before the coup. Ethiopian peasants' way of life was thoroughly influenced by the church teachings. 280 days a year are religious feasts or days of rest. Mengistu's years in office were marked by a totalitarian-style government and the country's massive militarization, financed by the Soviet Union and the Eastern Bloc, and assisted by Cuba. In December 1976, an Ethiopian delegation in Moscow signed a military assistance agreement with the Soviet Union. The following April 1977, Ethiopia abrogated its military assistance agreement with the United States and expelled the American military missions. The new regime in Ethiopia met with armed resistance from the large landowners, the royalists and the nobility. The resistance was largely centered in the province of Eritrea. The Derg decided in November 1974 to pursue war in Eritrea rather and seek a negotiated settlement. By mid-1976, the resistance had gained control of most of the town and the countryside of Eritrea. 
in July 1977, sensing the disarray in Ethiopia, Somalia attacked across the Ogaden in pursuit of its irredentist claims to the ethnic Somali areas of Ethiopia. C. Ogaden War They were assisted in this invasion by the armed Western Somali Liberation Front. Ethiopian forces were driven back far inside their own frontiers but, with the assistance of a massive Soviet airlift of arms and 17,000 Cuban combat forces, they stemmed the attack. The last major Somali regular units left the Ogade and March 15, 1978. Twenty years later, the Somali region of Ethiopia remained underdeveloped and insecure. From 1977 through early 1978, thousands of suspected enemies of the Derg were tortured and or killed in a purge called the Keshebir. Red Terror Communism was officially adopted during the late 1970s and early 1980s. In 1984, the Workers' Party of Ethiopia WPE was established, and on February 1, 1987, a new Soviet-style civilian constitution was submitted to a popular referendum. It was officially endorsed by 81% of voters, and in accordance with this new constitution, the country was renamed the People's Democratic Republic of Ethiopia on September 10, 1987, and Mengis II became president. The regime's collapse was hastened by droughts and a famine, which affected around 8 million people and left 1 million dead, as well as by insurrections, particularly in the northern regions of Tigray and Eritrea. The regime also conducted a brutal campaign of resettlement and villagization in Ethiopia in the 1980s. In 1989, the Tigrayan People's Liberation Front TPLF merged with other ethnically based opposition movements to form the Ethiopian People's Revolutionary Democratic Front EPRDF In May 1991, EPRDF forces advanced on Addis Ababa. Mengist who fled the country to asylum in Zimbabwe, where he still resides. Hundreds of thousands were killed due to the Red Terror, forced deportations, or from using hunger as a weapon. In 2006, after a long trial, Mengist who was found guilty of genocide. Part 7, Modern. Chapter 6, Federal Democratic Republic 1991 Present In July 1991, the EPRDF, the Oromo Liberation Front, OLF, and others established the Transitional Government of Ethiopia, TGE, which was composed of an 87-member Council of Representatives and guided by a national charter that functioned as a transitional constitution. In June 1992, the OLF withdrew from the government. In March 1993, members of the Southern Ethiopia People's Democratic Coalition also left the government. Eritrea separated from Ethiopia following the fall of the Derg in 1991, after a long independentist war. In 1994, a new constitution was written that formed a bicameral legislature and a judicial system. A general election in 1995 to elect the parliament also elected Miles Zenawi as prime minister and Negaso Gudada as president. Ethiopia's second multi-party election was held in 2000 and Miles was re-elected as prime minister. In October 2001, Lieutenant Goma World Jorgis was elected president. In the 2005 general election, allegations of irregularities that brought victory to the Ethiopian People's Revolutionary Democratic Front resulted in widespread protests in which the government is accused of massacring civilians. See Ethiopian Police Massacres With the collapse of the Soviet Union, and with the rise of radical Islamism, Ethiopia again turned to the Western powers for alliance and assistance. After the September 11 attacks in 2001, the Ethiopian army began to train with U.S. forces based out of the Combined Joint Task Force Horn of Africa CJTFHOA Established in Djibouti, in counterterrorism and counterinsurgency 
Ethiopia allowed the US to station military advisors at Camp Perso. In 2006, an Islamic organization seen by many as having ties with Al-Qaeda, the Islamic Courts Union, ICU, spread rapidly in Somalia, Ethiopia sent logistical support to the transitional federal government opposing the Islamists. Finally, on December 20, 2006, active fighting broke out between the ICU and Ethiopian army. As the Islamist forces were of no match against the Ethiopian regular army, they decided to retreat and merge among the civilians, and most of the ICU held Somalia was quickly taken. Human Rights Watch accused Ethiopia of various abuses including indiscriminate killing of civilians during the Battle of Mogadishu. March, April 2007 Ethiopian forces pulled out of Somalia in January 2009, leaving a small African Union force and smaller Somali transitional government force to maintain the peace. Reports immediately emerged of religious fundamentalist forces occupying one of two former Ethiopian bases in Mogadishu shortly after withdrawal. Miles Zenawi died on 20 August 2012 and was succeeded as Prime Minister by Hilimariam Desalegn. On 7 October 2013, Mulatu Teshom was elected President of the country. This recording is a derivative work from Wikipedia. For more information, please visit www.frogcast.org.